Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining our session today. My name is Cassidy Carmen Bates, and I'm the Government and Public Affairs Manager at the Food Bank of Contra Costa and Solano. Hi, everyone. My name is Bob Rilling Smith, and I'm the Food Bank of Contra Costa and Solano's Legislative Advocacy Associate. I'm so excited to be part of this great group here today to talk about our advocacy programs and the cause to end hunger. Today, we are very fortunate to have two of our community advocates, Jenny Burton and Kiva Dean. Jenny, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, I'm Jenny Burton. I am a Food Bank Speaker Series graduate and CAP member. Hello, my name is Kiva Dean and I'm an advocate for the Contra Costa Solano Food Bank and I'm happy to be here. Thank you. Thank you everyone for being here today. We are really looking forward to sharing with you about our Food Bank's advocacy program. Before we jump into a panel discussion that includes our two community advocates, Jenny and Kiva, we first wanna share a little background on our Food Bank, our Food Bank's advocacy work, and some best practices that we've learned if your Food Bank or organization is interested in implementing advocacy into your direct service organization. So our session title is Incorporating Lived Experience and Using an Equity Lens for Effective Advocacy. And so those are two themes we're really going to make sure we cover today. How can we effectively incorporate lived experience and those with a passion for food security into our advocacy work? And through all of that, how can we incorporate an equity lens? So a little bit of background about us. As our name states, we are the Food Bank of Contra Costa and Solano. So we serve primarily Contra Costa and Solano counties, which are two of the nine Bay Area counties here in California. But additionally, through our Feeding America affiliation, we also provide support to the 16 counties north of us. So much of Northern California up to the Oregon border. And in 2021, we were additionally named the California Disaster Hub by Feeding America to provide even more logistic and support to these food banks, especially as we saw another wildfire season here in California. So what do our operations look like at the Food Bank of Contra Costa and Solano? So we have been operational since 1975. As many food bankers on this session will be familiar with, we store and distribute food that has either been donated to us or purchased by us. We have a few ways that we distribute this food, either directly through our food bank programs, which operate seven days a week, or through our community partners, which I will talk about in our next slide. We are able to do all of this because of the amazing support we have from our volunteers. We have about 5,000 volunteers that support us monthly. Our staff is now over 100 staff members, and we have a warehouse location in each of our two counties. And for any fundraising or development folks on the call, one thing we like to share to really speak to the purchasing power and the effectiveness of food banking is that for every $1 donated to the Food Bank of Contra Costa in Solano, we are able to provide two meals for our community. So $1 is equivalent to two meals. We are able to really meet the need in our community because of the partnerships we have. And one of the ways that we do this is through our agency partners. So as you'll see on this slide, we have over 260 of these agency partners. And through them, we are able to provide food directly to these organizations. And then they in turn provide it to the individuals that they serve and work with. We do serve one in nine residents of our service area and over 25% of those served are children. And I do just want to note here that, you know, some of these numbers we have are pre-COVID, but as I'm sure almost everyone on this call has observed, there's been a dramatic increase in the amount of food insecurity probably most of us have seen in our communities since the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic. So specifically advocacy, that's what brings many of us to this policy conference. Our advocacy team was established at our food bank in 2015. We are currently a two person team, so very strong but mighty. And we are nested within our organization's development department. We offer two community-based programs, which is what this PowerPoint will really transition into speaking more to. And we advocate on the regional, state, and national levels. 
One main function of our team is to maintain the policy partnerships for our organization. So whether that is with county officials, our elected officials, we also do the legislative steering for our organization. So looking at the strategic planning, where does our organization want to go in the next three to five years? And how is advocacy a part of that? How can our annual legislative cycles really help achieve those goals for our community? As I mentioned, um, advocacy is something that is really important at our food bank. And if you are thinking about implementing this at your organization, or even you have something, but you want to refine it, I wanted to share a little bit about how we are framing advocacy in our work. So here's a brief definition, but we see advocacy as an activity by a group or an individual that aims to influence a decision. At different times, depending on the legislative landscape, maybe the most that an advocacy group or individual can achieve is increasing awareness. But at other times, it can be opposing or supporting legislation, funding, any public decision in that way. What we really like to also share with our advocates is that as an advocate, you, the individual, you have the ability to be a voice, a, a loud voice for those who feel they're maybe not respected or represented. And we want to ensure that this is done with dignity. That's something we really stress in all our advocacy work and really all of our food bank operations, that we want individuals to be met with and um, really experience dignity throughout the entire process of advocating. Our team's mission statement, I put it here just to briefly share how we again center ourselves and we're a two-person team, we have a large territory, so where do we focus our efforts? The main place we start is wanting to look at the root causes specific to our region. So why is hunger being perpetuated? Why is food insecurity being experienced at the levels that it is in our service area, in a Bay Area County? In order to effectively direct our advocacy, we find it incredibly important to incorporate the experiences and voices of those with lived experience of our community members, which is what our upcoming panel discussion will really go through. And all of this is an effort to eventually eliminate food security and create more sustainable food systems. I'm really excited to now transition into our speaker series. As I mentioned, we have two community-based programs that are operated through our advocacy team. And what I want to do when sharing with all of you about our speaker series is share what has gone really well, some lessons that we've learned, and some best practices. So if you are considering um, starting something like a speaker series and further incorporating your community volunteers, that you can learn from our past experiences from what's really worked in our region. So to start, our speaker series is an annual advocacy training program for community members with lived experience and those passionate about ending hunger. The objective of this program is really to amplify the voices of those impacted by food insecurity and provide them with the tools to effectively advocate. So this is currently a six week program. I will say that the speaker series looked much different prior to COVID. So what I'm going to be sharing with you all now is sort of a revamped program that we have since rolled out since making this program fully virtual. So it currently runs for six weeks from April through May, um, through mid-May about, and we have it strategically end at the start of Hunger Action Week, which is the largest week of action for food security in the state of California. Um, throughout the speaker series, our participants meet for two hours weekly, and we have currently 10 to 15 participants in the session. I'll talk more about this on the next slide, but it is um, purposeful that we keep the cohort sizes small because we really recognize and honor that we are asking advocates and community members to share what might be more vulnerable experiences for them as we ask them to talk about food security and food insecurity, I should say. And so by keeping the cohort size small, our goal is really to achieve a close-knit community where individuals feel comfortable sharing and speaking on these topics.
And I will get more into this on a later slide, but we do um, recognize the value in individuals sharing their time and their experience with us. And we do provide compensation for the participants. So moving into what the speaker series looks like from a curriculum standpoint. So six weeks, five of those weeks are workshop focused and one of those weeks is the day of action. That's how I mentioned it ending on hunger action week. So my predecessor who actually developed this program did develop the program based off of another food bank's speakers bureau that was taking part on the east coast and that speakers bureau was based off of the toastmasters techniques so over time our speaker series has taken many forms and evolved but we still integrate those toastmaster themes of professional development public speaking empowerment and we do try and gather together a mix of individuals who have lived experience, those who might work in the field, those who are passionate about ending um, hunger in our community. We also invite guest speakers. We recognize as an advocacy team that that would be a lot to listen to just the advocacy staff members talk for six weeks straight. So we try and bring in subject matter experts, alumni of the program to really buffer, um, really buff up the um, curriculum. So we have a diverse opinion and collection of individuals. Um, I'll briefly take us through what those six weeks look like. We do start with having each individual identify their why. What is that driving, motivating factor? We know what we're going for, we know how we're going for it, we know advocacy is gonna be our method, but why? Why is it that you show up to be a hunger fighter? We also talk about the fundamentals of public policy and what is advocacy. We talk about storytelling, the power of persuasion, how each individual has a story to share, whether or not you know what that story is going into the session, we want to help you really articulate that. We then have the main deliverable, if you will, of this program is that each advocate comes away with their personal hunger story. This is intended to be about a two minute speech that they are ready to share in advocacy, whether that's in a legislative meeting, whether that's in a space like we have here today, but it should be a really great working draft that they have. Um, and then we culminate the series with a mock legislative visit. So we bring in one of our elected officials. Last year we had State Senator um, Steve Glazer join us. And we run through a full legislative visit so that before we have Hunger Action Week, advocates really have that initial exposure to what advocacy looks like in play. So as I mentioned, recognition of expertise. Um, this is something that if you are you know, thinking of implement, implementing advocacy further in your organization, I would really strongly suggest you ensure you have funding to recognize the expertise of your community advocates. So what we do is provide a grocery gift card for each session attended, so six sessions. Um, we then also offer for those who graduate the series, they make it through all six sessions, an additional $100 grocery gift card as a thank you. It's a thank you for your time, for your participation, but we also recognize that there is so much value in lived experience, in the expertise of each individual, and want to make sure that we are really acknowledging that. So the second community-based program I want to transition to talking about before I introduce our panel is what we call CAP for short, but it's our Community Advocacy Partnership. This is more of a stationary advocacy group that meets year round. So as I mentioned, the speaker series runs April to May. That is really where we um, find our advocates, if you will. It's almost the training program for becoming advocates. Um, those advocates can come to us through many ways, whether it's agency partners, whether they're clients of the food bank. But once the speaker series um, session has finished and the cohort members graduate, we invite them all to join CAP. And as I said, CAP runs all year long and we have really worked hard to integrate CAP members into every aspect of our policy process throughout the year. So let me dive more into what that looks like specifically. So our CAP object objective is to ensure that we are bringing in the qualitative aspects into our public policy work. 
So a lot of times public policy work can be very quantitative, heavy on the research, on the data, but we think that there is so much value in the lived experience, the more anecdotal qualitative side. So this is what CAP really enables us to do effective policy work. We really believe that our CAP group is so strong because we have put such a focus on um, equity, diversity in all ways, whether it's in education, religion, race, city of residence. We want our CAP group to be very reflective and representative of the community we're serving and of the individuals who experience and interact with food insecurity in our community. So what does the CAP programming look like behind the scenes? So we have consistent meetings. We have fluctuated between bi-monthly, quarterly. We've even done monthly meetings. For anyone out there who is thinking of implementing programs like this at their own organization, I will say that when we were meeting monthly and assigning homework assignments to advocates, we did observe um, a little bit of burnout, a little bit of um, over time, that being too much. So I would say my best piece of advice is just to be very um, open to suggestion and flexible, asking your advocates what works best with your schedule, how frequently do you want to meet, do you want longer meetings where we can incorporate more educational components, or do you want those as take-home assignments? So just being really flexible to make sure that it's mutually beneficial for everyone involved. On that note, we do try and always provide opportunities for our advocates to continue learning and growing. So a big part of the CAP curriculum is professional development and educational components throughout the year for continued learning, whether that's on advocacy, public speaking, the legislative process, the budget, anything like that. On this next slide, um, this is just really a preview of, I think, what our panel will do a great job of diving deeper into. But we really, you know, as this session is talking about how we're bringing an equity lens to advocacy, this is where our CAP members play a very pivotal role. We really want our CAP members to be a great influence on our policy scope. You know, what are we even focusing on, our policy priority, process, what are we going to focus on in the next year? So from every aspect of how our public policy works our organization, we try and include our CAP members as much as we can. And one thing that I think our panel will also touch on is how this truly allows us to have an even larger impact than if it was just our advocacy staff members, the two of us running everything. We want to hear from those with lived experience, you know, what has it been like going to the county office, applying for CalFresh, what needs to be better? From those specific conversations is where we learned a few years ago that we needed to be advocating for telephonic signatures to eliminate the need for individuals to have to go in person to their county office. So that's just one of many examples of how bringing in these voices in really strategic ways helps us have an even larger impact than your food bank staff members may be able to have individually. So lessons learned. What could you know you do in your process of implementing this? So ensure accurate representation of your service area. At one point, we realized that we had a majority of our members from one specific city within our service area. And that was not um, helpful to understanding what's going on in other portions of our service area. So in your recruitment process for community volunteers and advocates, try and be really intentional about getting out to all um, parts of your community, and especially if there are parts of your community that are underrepresented or you feel like you don't have much contact with, make a special effort to go there and then try and bring in individuals who can share their experience. Um, providing time for advocates to share their truth and expertise. So like I mentioned, it can be a lot for just food bank staff members to try and lead these modules from a capacity standpoint, but also from being inclusive and you know take space, leave space. Provide time for your advocates to lead modules, share their learning, and understand that we are asking advocates to be vulnerable in sharing their lived experience. So honor time for that trust to be built and that space to really be cultivated. Um, finally, on this slide, acknowledge the time commitment that we're all asking for. We touched on this earlier, but 
see with your advocate group if it works best to provide work time during something like a speaker series session to really work on those hunger stories, or if your advocates need a little more personal time to work and they prefer homework. Um, meeting frequency, we talked about monthly versus quarterly. Travel time versus virtual options. I will say that since we transitioned our speaker series to being fully virtual, we have been able to include advocates from beyond our two county service area, and they have provided a perspective that we don't have from just our two county service area. So there's a lot of benefits to either way you choose to operate your program. And finally here, some best practices. I think we've touched on a lot of this, but in closing, I wanna share that we really believe the speaker series in CAP, our community advocacy partnership, they can be scalable and accessible. So if you think that this is something you're interested in doing, virtual component might be a great place to start. And we really believe that this method of having a training program and then transitioning to a stationary advocacy program is one that can be implemented in food banks nationwide. Um, secondly, ensure your volunteers feel reciprocated and can continue to grow. So ensure that you're doing things that, you know, providing grocery gift cards, providing ongoing training opportunities, professional development opportunities. Ensure that advocates feel like their expertise and time is valued and not just that you're bringing them in when you need them for your own advocacy purposes. Um, finally, we feel like it is really necessary to have a speaker series style program and something like CAP. Um, we now encourage all of our CAP members to go through the speaker series in advance. That has not always been how we've organized and structured our program. But since we have, we've seen that having everyone trained and on the same page has really allowed us to feel um, well, for the advocates to feel all confident that they have the same skills and abilities and feel very comfortable and confident to go forward and advocate. Um, oh, and one more, in the recruitment for the speaker series, ask advocates to encourage applications within their network. So utilize the advocates you already have in this way as well, asking them to share this opportunity with those that they may might know through their own networks to bring in future advocates. So before I hand it over to the panel discussion, thank you for your time. Um, here is our contact information if you are wanting to keep the conversation going and want to you know, potentially talk about how we can support you if you're interested in starting something like this at your own food bank. So thank you so much. And with that, I will hand it back over to Bob, Jenny, and Kiva for our panel. Thank you, Cassidy. Uh, I'm excited to turn to the panel discussion portion of our event. Today, we have two veterans of the speaker series in Community Advocacy Partnership, Kiva Dean and Jenny Burton. We are thrilled to have the opportunity to talk about our advocacy programs from the perspectives of two of our advocates themselves. Let's get to it. Cassidy did such a great job of outlining and explaining the speaker series. Jenny, from your perspective, what were your initial expectations for the speaker series? And what did you take from the course? Um, yes, Bob. So I'm a college health nurse and I joined the speaker series with my daughter, who's a high school senior. And I really had no expectations prior to joining. Um, this program really empowered me and that's my main takeaway. I've learned a lot about legislation in our state um, and how bills become law. And I've participated in my first webinar with the CAP speaker series program. And I'm really gaining confidence with each new advocacy opportunity that your group is putting forth to me. That's great, Jenny. And I'm trying to make sure that our, our participants are empowered and, and kind of gain that uh, experience and confidence throughout is so important to us. Thank you for sharing. Kiva, I'll pose the same question to you. Uh, what were your initial expectations for the speaker series and what did you take from the course? So Bob, when I first read about the uh, speaker series, I didn't really have any expectations. I wasn't quite sure exactly what was going to happen. Um, but as I got involved, more involved with, uh, and the, the speaker series went on and on, um, I realized that it was going to help me with my confidence. Um, I realized that making my uh, hunger story, devising my hunger story, was very empowering and um, it helped me be more um, vocal 
about my my process and about what I went through. And it gave me, again, more confidence. So um, by the time I finished with the advocacy program, I was really, um, the speaker series, I was really excited to start advocacy. That's great, Kiva. I, I know you mentioned the word confidence a few times, and that's that's great that you were able to to really gain that confidence from participating in the speaker series. That, that's fantastic. Uh, and then kind of with the speaker series, and as Cassidy described really well, one component of the speaker series that's so, so crucial to its success and uh, it's kind of its foundation is really finding our why, uh, why we choose to be hunger fighters. So Kiva, I'll pose the question to you first. Uh, how did you come up with your why and has it evolved over time to maybe becoming something bigger than your, your initial why? So Bob, one of my, uh, my, my initial why was a story that my 26 year old told me um, when she was 14 and in junior high school, um, we were still receiving assistance uh, to some degree. And she went to school, she was in line to get her lunch and I had owed some money. And so they denied her her lunch um, because she owed money for, um, for her bill. So um, I realized that no student should be shamed or should be called out or should be denied nutrition simply because their parent doesn't have the resources to pay their bill. And so um, my why initially became, uh, my initially was to make sure that students and children were not shamed because they lacked. Um, and as the speaker series went on, I realized that I have a real passion for another topic, and that is um, meals as medicine, food as medicine. That's great, Kiva. And well, I'm really excited to get forward to uh, talking about food as medicine, or food as medicine, a little bit later. But it's it's great that you're able to share your story uh, from that lived experience perspective as well. Uh, and for all the viewers out there, in case you don't know, California became the first state in the nation to adopt universal school meals, and we're so excited about that. So people like uh, like. Kiva and her family won't have to go through that in the future. And it's largely because of people like Kiva and their tireless advocacy that helped bring that to fruition. So Kiva, thank you so much for sharing. And then Jenny, I'll pose the same question to you. Uh, what is your why? Why do you choose to be a hunger fighter? Well, Bob, um, I'm a college hunger fighter because I see firsthand in my work as a college health nurse that food insecurity worsens chronic illness and stress. So I believe that food security can help our college students reach their potential. So basically, Bob, my personal hunger story is my 15 second elevator pitch. And in this busy world, sometimes 15 seconds is all you have. So I think it's um, really an important piece of um, what the hunger, uh, what the advocacy program offers. That's great, Jenny. Yeah, and I, I agree. You know, as as you both have learned, uh, and I've learned too. You know, sometimes you don't have you know a lot of time to actually advocate, to actually be in front of someone who's influential and able to bring about change. And it really does benefit us as advocates to really have our message down to, you know, maybe not a soundbite, but something that that's clear and concise and very captivating, uh, like both of you have, and all of our our advocates have. Uh, and, and to, to Cassidy's point, adding those anecdotal stories, that qualitative uh, component is so helpful when combining with the data that we do have, unfortunately, on hunger. And it, it's great that you both have been able to find your why. Uh, thank you so much for, for sharing. Uh, and as also, as Cassidy mentioned, you know, our second component of our advocacy program is our Community Advocacy Partnership, or CAP for short. Uh, and, you know, Cassidy did a great job of, of detailing it and describing it and why it's so effective. Uh, but we'd like to talk a little bit about CAP from the perspective of our advocates, uh, not just the food bank. So, Jenny, how has CAP influenced your advocacy efforts? Um, well, Bob, I think of CAP as being the bridge between the food bank speaker series and your real life that you go off to live after you've finished the 
speaker series. Um, so basically CAP members are speaker graduates who choose to continue on as hunger fighters. And I've really enjoyed coming together with them and sharing our advocacy strides because I love hearing about people's small successes every day and it inspires me and I think all of us to advocate further for hunger. And also it's a place where we can come together and problem solve and discuss issues that we're having together and, you know, think about how we can maneuver around issues we might be having in common. So as a CAP member, I work in college health. I propose that we um, screen for food insecurity in our wellness divisions and it was embraced. And people who screen positive, we will be referring to the pantry on campus as well as to CalFresh and SNAP benefits. That's great, Jenny. Thank you so much. And yeah, I, I wrote down, you know, two things that you said, you know, coming together and, and problem solving. That really is what CAP is all about. And as Cassidy mentioned, our food bank is advocacy team is only two people. And having our community advocacy partnership really kind of expands the reach of our food bank. And, you know, for all the viewers out there, you know, I, I really think that the smaller your food bank, the really more beneficial at having a cap like program is because it does expand your reach. And we'll get into it later. But I mean, when you add in lived experience and, and really trying to view hunger uh, through an equity lens, it really it really does help. And I know from Cassie and I's perspective, uh, being that we're only two people, again, uh, having Jenny and Kiva's uh, opinion and background has really helped inform our, our advocacy agenda, our legislative agenda and everything we, we fight for. And I know on a personal level, they both have opened my eyes to, you know, hunger from their perspective. And, you know, as you know, Jenny, as as you see every day on a college campus and see, you know, student hunger, which is really one of those, you know, kind of invisible forms of hunger, you know, as a college student, I, you know, I was a college student, didn't even realize it. And you've been able to really help me to understand how, uh, you know, hunger has many faces. And I don't think I would have gotten that perspective without our without our CAP program. So it's, uh, yeah, thank you so much for, for sharing, Jenny. And then Kiva, how would you say the CAP program has influenced you? So Bob, um, I felt really supported by CAP uh, since I've graduated from the speaker series. Um, I have presented to legislators for uh, primary and secondary school lunches. I have um, been the focus of an article for hunger and domestic violence. Um, the Contra Costa, um, I, the Contra Costa Food Bank uh, has given me the honor of representing them with the CAPP program. That's Collaborative Advocacy Power Partnership Program. It's a two-year program where we learn um, the ins and outs of advocacy all the way from um, the the uh, requirements for 5013C C3 to uh, lobbying, to leadership, to equity. Um, and I am really learning a lot from that program. Uh, I also got the opportunity to present to the Contra Costa Board of Supervisors in regards to uh, food as medicine. And so I feel really supported and I feel very um, confident because of the support that the, the CAP has um, afforded me. That's great, Kiva. Thank you so much. And I'm glad you were able to kind of describe what, what Cassidy uh, described also, is that we really want our advocacy programs for our volunteer advocates to be mutually beneficial. So it's obviously it's beneficial to the food bank, as Cassie and I have described how you know important you all are to our advocacy efforts. But we also want you all to get a sense of empowerment throughout throughout the program. And I think you're the embodiment of that, Kiva, and all the, you know, it's really been a, a springboard for you to all of the tremendous advocacy work you've done right here in our community. And our community is so much better off because you're out there, you know, every day doing stuff for everyone. And that's really what the goal of our advocacy program is. It's again, it's not just for food bank, but it's really to lift up community members for our community. And that, that's, it's, thank you for sharing that. That's, that's great. 
Uh, all right. Now, turning to another uh, a big important concept for us in our advocacy programs, as Cassidy mentioned, is lived experience. Kiva, I'll begin with you. Uh, and you've talked about it a little bit so far, but how has your lived experience shaped your advocacy uh, in fighting hunger? Um, my lived experience has been a, an, an enormous part in shaping um, my determination to advocate for um, uh, hunger. When I was a, a little girl, I'm number eight of nine children, and my mom was a single mom, and she had to have shelf-stable foods like um, rice and corn and beans and potatoes and flour and sugar because she had so many um, children to feed. And we know that um, the cost of healthy food is much greater than the cost of shelf stable food. And we also know that um, that in, in poor neighborhoods, you have uh, conditions such as diabetes, high blood pressure, heart disease, high cholesterol, because they're um, exposed and eat with uh, eat those types of foods. And so I remember even as a kid, you know, when you're a kid, you think um, my, my mom's going to make candy for dinner. We had something called pulley taffy and we were so excited to have pulley taffy for, for dinner one day. But that's because all my mom had in the refrigerator was some butter and sugar and um, corn syrup. And so she put that together and she made something that we call pulley taffy because we could pull it and eat it. We didn't know that we were um, eating that because we didn't have any other food. We thought that that was just a treat, right? Um, and then also me personally, I was on cash aid, food stamps, Medi-Cal, WIC, um, Section 8. And now I'm a supervisor in the same building 25 years later. I'm a supervisor in the same building where I receive those benefits. And so it's really important for me to, under, uh, to, to advocate because I know how it feels to be on both sides of that desk. And I want, I want the... Uh, those people who receive our services and those people who need our services to have a visual and to have an understanding that they can come out of their situation. Um, and also to understand that um, we can do better with our lives. We can have better nutrition. We can eat better. Um, I don't know if I wanted to go into this, but Practice, uh, some people say practice makes perfect. I say practice makes habit. And if you practice eating good, eating good, you have good health outcomes. And if you uh, practice eating bad, you have bad health, um, health outcomes. So I am really, really um, excited and really determined to end hunger and to end hunger in a nutritious and healthy way. Kiva, that, that's great. And I, I love how you really tied together both your lived experience and then also uh, a topic that we can talk about right now uh, in food is medicine and really how one led you to the other, right? How your lived experience with what you grew up with in terms of the things that you, you know, had to eat with, with, your, with your mom just because you didn't have the resources to really have a, a healthy and nutritious diet. And, you know, on the one hand, you know, it's, it's, it's great that you've come out the other side, like you said, right? Like it, it's been so, and again, you're, like you said, you're working in the same building that you were in 25 years ago and can really give that perspective of your lived experience. And I'm sure it's so beneficial to all the people that you serve right here in, in our County. Uh, so that, that's great. Uh, and then let's, let's continue talking about food as medicine. So, you know, what you, you started, to, you began to, to mention, you know, your diet and then how, and then I, I loved your, and I always love when you say it, your, you know, you know, practice makes habit. I really believe that. So tell me what, what food is medicine means to you a little bit more in terms of like what really the benefits could be for our community and I guess more generally for people's health. Okay. Well, um, again, um, practice makes habit. And so people um, people know that even before the 
pandemic, healthy foods cost more. Um, and so we have a tendency with those of us who were in economically disadvantaged communities, um, we had a tendency to eat shelf stable foods because they cost less um, and they are more accessible. Everybody knows that if you have a dollar, you can go to McDonald's and you can buy a, 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 a hamburger and you might be able to be filled at least for that moment. Um, however, a dollar could, could possibly could not buy you a healthy meal. Um, and so it's really important that we provide healthy meals and healthy food for every human being across the board, because we know that healthy foods and healthy meals and healthy nutrition uh, produces healthy outcomes. And like I said, unhealthy uh, produces unhealthy outcomes. And also, I'd like to say that, you know, people say you can't change uh, horses in the middle of the stream. That's not true. That's not true. If you start eating healthy and, and develop those health, healthy habits, habits of eating, um, then you can change the outcomes of your health conditions. Uh, there are some people who have abated or decreased or even eliminated diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol from their lives simply by changing their eating habits. I remember when I told my daughters, okay, no more whole milk, no more white bread. We're going to change. We're going to eat. And they were like, mom, I can't do it. I can't do it. But now my children are, as adults, now they eat on a, uh, on a much healthier level. Um, and now they exercise and they and I'm I'm uh, practicing what I preach. In fact, um, I have been eating much more healthily ever since I've been advocating for food and medicine, um, lost some weight, um, uh, blood pressure is much better because truthfully high uh, health healthy nutrition produces healthy outcomes. And so it's really important for people to have to put a, a face also to what we're saying. And so I'm here not just as someone who um, received benefits and now is giving benefits in the same building that I did, that I received them in, but I'm here as someone who had some unhealthy outcomes and now I have healthy outcomes because I'm practicing what I preach. And that's why I want to be, uh, I'm very determined to be more of an advocate for food and medicine. That's great, Kiva. And again, I, I like how you use the word determined there at the end. You know, your lived experience has really led you to see, you know, what you lacked at one point in your life and how food is medicine can really make up for that. And you're determined to do that because of your lived experience. That's great. Yeah. And then, Jenny, uh, we're so lucky to have you here with your health background. If you'd like to talk or take a couple of minutes just to talk about uh, how you know, how important food as medicine is from a health perspective. I mean, you see it on a college campus every day in terms of, you know, student hunger and, and the different, you know, shapes that might take. Uh, but if you just want to talk a little bit about kind of maybe the intersection between uh, nutritious food and, and even in college hunger as well, too. Absolutely, Bob. So college students face food insecurity at rates above the national average. And during the pandemic shutdown of many of the colleges across our country, the rate of hunger doubled in some states and some on some college campuses. So um, students who are not getting enough food really can't focus in the classroom and the retention of their um, learned material takes a hit and they are at risk of dropping out of school if they're filling their classes. So this has a long term effect for them in terms of their, you know, their earning potential down the road. Also, food insecurity takes a toll on a student's physical health um, because the body needs essential nutrients to maintain its well-being. And then um, just being food insecure causes a lot of stress for students. And when that's not dealt with, it can lead to anxiety and depression for students. Thank you, Jenny. Yeah, I know, like I alluded to earlier, you know, as a college student, I, you know, there were days where I would only eat maybe once a day or have a really poor diet. And it's just something you kind of expect or uh, accept as being, you know, it's not a big deal. You're supposed to be hungry or have a poor diet as a college student. But you've really opened my eyes to the seriousness of the issue. 
And some of the stats that I've read on, you know, the, you know, likelihood of graduation, the likelihood of graduation on time, uh, and, you know, grade point average, all of it, the statistics are, are shockingly are bad for, for students who are experiencing hunger. And it's so great that, again, we look, we're here in the Bay Area to all the viewers out there, and, you know, housing is really expensive out here, and that really impacts college students as well obviously. And Jenny, we are so lucky to have you that you're a voice for college hunger. And we're making strides in college hunger right here in the state of California, because of people like you who are raising this issue to the forefront where it needs to be. And we're finally making progress. So, so thank you so much for really, you know, bringing your lived experience with, with, with uh, seeing college hunger every day. And, and not only, you know, bringing results, but just first raising awareness has been so, so crucial to the topic, even for someone like me who, you know, went through it. So it, it's, it's, uh, it, thank you so much. We're so lucky to have you. All right. And then talk, and turning to a topic that's kind of similar, but uh, one that, as Cassidy also mentioned, is hugely important to us at the food bank here. And that's the, the concept of equity and how it's highly important to view uh, a lot of the things that we advocate for through that lens of equity, making making sure that we're keeping that front and center in terms of the agenda we pursue. So, uh, Jenny, I'll turn to you. What does what does equity mean to you in terms of hunger? You know, you probably see different students on the campus every day from different backgrounds. And how would you say equity shapes your view of hunger? Um, for me, Bob, equity is looking at individuals and understanding where they're coming from and what their personal experience is versus teaching, treating college students as a group um, and just um, treating those struggling with hunger based on their individual circumstances, basically, so we can serve them, especially when we're working on a small scale such as myself, you know, versus um, assuming, um, learning and listening and understanding and meeting where they are. Thank you so much, Jenny. And then Kiva, I'll pose the same question to you. What does equity mean to you and how does it shape your view of hunger? So um, hunger is um, a condition, a human condition. Um, it is something that all of us can experience. And so I see, um, first of all, I'd like to say that our CAP group and our, our speaker series is a very good um, example of equity um, because hunger has all faces. Anyone, any ethnicity, any color, any background, any religion, any person can have hunger. Um, food is a human right and hunger is a human condition. So in regards to equity, it's simply about making sure that whether you have, whether you're hungry or not, there's no stigma. You need to come and get food. You need to, to search out and seek out resources for food. And the problem sometimes is that people put stigma on lack and on need. And so as a result, people do not reach out and, and um, find resources for themselves or use the resources that are available because of stigma. If we do away with the stigma, then we won't have an equity issue. That's great, Kiva. And I, I really think this, the stigma that you mentioned, you know, repeatedly is so crucial and also coupled with, you know, food really being a human right. You know, if we can remove the stigma to like, to your point, then and I know you've mentioned before that you've also been a little bit apprehensive about using some government programs that you were entitled to and were intended for you just because of that stigma that you personally felt. And now, you know, as, as you've said, that you, you kind of work in the same building that you got benefits in 25 years later. So it, I think you're on the front lines every day removing that stigma, which I think is great. I think that's, you know, one step at a time is so important. And I know, as I've mentioned earlier, by, you know, we are only two people here in our advocacy team and we couldn't really pursue a legislative and policy agenda without all of you, without all of our advocates, uh, because you really are the equity, right? You're the, that's what, that's what we need to, to really 
to be able to view our community kind of holistically and not just as numbers on a page. And you both have been so uh, influential to, to Cassie and I and the whole group has, and we're so lucky to have you. And to all the viewers out there, it, it's again, especially I go back to if you're a smaller food bank, you can really leverage your your advocacy efforts by by having uh, a volunteer based advocacy program. It can really you can really incorporate lived experience and equity by doing so. And uh, we're, we're so grateful to have the program here in the Food Bank of Contra Costa and Solano. All right. Now, changing topics a little bit. Uh, concerns what some of all of our viewers have gone through during the pandemic is the idea of advocacy kind of turning into virtual advocacy and what that's meant to everyone, you know, the positive, the negatives, the ups, the downs, as we're, you know, on year two plus of the pandemic. Uh, so, uh, Jenny, I'll, po I'll pose the, the first question to you. How has advocating virtually gone for you? Uh, have you seen any benefits to you maybe that you didn't expect or have any recommendations for the audience? Yeah, so Bob, I'm just so happy to have found the speaker series during the pandemic because a lot of programming did shut down for volunteering or just being involved or connecting with others because during shelter in place, we were really you know, sequestered, so to speak. So I was happy to find the speaker series as a safe way to volunteer with the food bank and actually be making an impact by speaking to legislators and elected officials. So um, it, for me personally, it was a wonderful way to meet with our elected officials because I may not have gone to Sacramento or to Washington DC to speak to them because I would have been a little intimidated, but this virtual format worked for me because I've been doing so much Zoom in general that um, it didn't seem so um, intimidating. So I would say that was definitely a perk for me. And I hope that going forward, we consider um, being able to utilize virtual formats in forms in portions of the speaker series because it was just great meeting people that maybe I wouldn't have had we not had that opportunity. That's great, Jenny. I'm so glad that you've really been able to find a lot of the positives in, in virtual advocacy. And I know we have here too at the food bank more generally. And as Cassidy mentioned, you know, our food bank, you know, mainly serves two counties, but we also serve the 16 counties to our north, which is a for all the viewers out there, it's, you know, Northern California doesn't end at San Francisco. It keeps going, you know, a, a lot <laughs> further. And having the option for virtual advocacy really expands our reach in terms of being able to have more people and have more voices at the table. And we're so grateful to have that. And I really do think that, you know, as you both have mentioned to me before that kind of having that virtual advocacy is kind of like a, a bridge maybe and really a stepping stone as you build your confidence you're able to feel like you could take on more and more so i think that's great that, that you you uh have that experience jenny and then kiva I'll, I'll pass the same question to you how has uh virtual advocacy gone for you i know you've done a lot of volunteer work beforehand which was you know mainly in person but how has the 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 advocacy gone virtually for you these last two years? So um, like Jenny said, it, it gave me the opportunity to build up my confidence um, without actually being in front of uh, a crowd, although I'm willing to do that as well. Um, I think that the technology has really um, become uh, a way of reaching a larger audience we can advocate across the world now. We're not limited to, in person, we're limited to that room we're in or that person that we're talking to. And there, there are um, benefits to being um, physically um, in someone's presence. However, there are benefits as well to, to having technology and being able to virtually advocate because you can reach a larger audience and you, and you have more eyes and more hearts to, um, more eyes and more ears to affect and more hearts to affect as well. Um, so, and, and on top of that, as a result of being, um, being able to do th this advocacy online, this advocacy with technology, I've expanded um, not just 
advocacy for food bank, but now I'm doing advocacy for homeless. I'm on the homeless council as well because of all of the uh, practice and all of the, the, the way that we're able to expand and reach uh, different audiences. That's great, Kiva. I mean, you're you've done so much and you've really, you know, taken this virtual advocacy to the next level. And we were benefiting not only here at the food bank, but also, again, in our in our community across the board. And uh, I know you've also mentioned that kind of that the intersection between homelessness and uh, food insecurity. And now you're able to take your your background with food insecurity and really, you know, apply it to to homelessness as too. And, it, you know, again, the benefits to our community are are innumerable so we're, we're so grateful uh for you to that and akiva i'll ask you another follow-up question uh maybe to some of the viewers out there who maybe haven't had uh the opportunity to do a lot of virtual advocacy uh would you give them any recommendations for maybe like something you would have liked to known when you started doing this uh uh at the beginning of the pandemic um, I think that the speaker series was an awesome place to start. They, uh, the speaker series gave me the opportunity to practice, um, to make mistakes, to get, get feedback, to um, expand my abilities. Um, and I, I think that um, just the more you do it, the more you're comfortable with it. it. It doesn't matter whether it's in person or um, through technology, the more you advocate, the more you speak with others, the, the more comfortable you, and more confident you become. And you'll find that with your comfort, you become more passionate. I'm, I'm much more passionate uh, now. Uh, and I love the fact that, just going back for a second, I love the fact that the speaker series gave me the confidence to do this so that I was able to find my passion of food for medicine. That's great, Kiva. And I think I really like the way you, you know, transition your confidence into passion. I think that's great. I think it's, I, I would agree with you that when you become more comfortable, you're able to, you know, maybe to expand your reach a little bit too, as you, you know, you, as you gain that confidence. And that's great that you've been able to do that. And it, I mean, it definitely shows. And again, your outreach has been tremendous, not only on hunger, but again, all the other stuff you do right here in our community. And we're, we're so grateful to have you. And then I would just like to, to mention to all the viewers out there, uh, if maybe you haven't, you know, maybe your food bank, you know, hasn't made advocacy a priority or, you know, you just haven't had the resources. Uh, and you might think that as the pandemic ends that, you know, virtual advocacy might go back to, to in person, but you know a lot of uh, elected officials and their staff members really prefer uh, virtual meetings just because you know from a logistics and time perspective they're able to do a lot more. So I know here at the food bank we're really expecting that uh, a good portion of advocacy going forward will likely remain virtual. So it's something to really keep an eye on as you're building a speaker series type program or a CAP program is really keeping an eye towards building a lot of the content and the material and uh, the program itself with that virtual idea to it. I think it's, I know we've, we've really transitioned here at the food bank to it's really become a, a, a core component going forward of our advocacy efforts. Uh, but yeah, thank you, Jenny. Thank you, Kiva, uh, on on how quickly you've been able to adapt to, to virtual advocacy because it, it's not easy, you know, it, it's not. So so thank you so much. All right. Now, turning to uh, one topic that Cassidy mentioned too in terms of lessons learned. So I'd like to talk a little about lessons learned from the advocate's perspective. Kiva, I'll begin with you. What are, what are, and you've kind of talked a little bit about it, but what are some of the lessons uh, that you've learned going through the speaker series program and the CAP program? And how would you uh, kind of convey those to, to the audience who maybe hasn't gone through a, a similar experience like you? Well, Bob, I want to echo Jenny in saying that CAP um, is sort of the bridge between the speaker series and my advocacy life. Um, lifestyle. 
And uh, so the lesson that I've learned is some of the lessons that I've learned are that it, you have to put yourself out there. You have to um, be be vulnerable enough to um, want to participate in an advocacy program in a speaker series. Someone needs to hear your voice. Your voice will touch someone's heart and your story will touch someone's heart. Um, but you have to be vulnerable enough to allow yourself to, to tell your story so that you can uh, touch someone's heart. I believe that my voice um, is the voice of many. And I believe that Jimmy's voice is the voice of many. And so um, that's one lesson that I've learned. I've learned that it's okay to make mistakes and it is okay to be supported. The CAP, um, our CAP uh, program does support me and it, it is uh, wonderful to feel supported. And um, I also learned that once you start doing something that you love, you will expand and you will touch um, live, the lives of many. And um, so the, the being in a speaker series, being in an advocacy program can be beneficial both to the organization that you are advocating for and to your own personal life. Um, because once you find your voice, then you find your power. Well, that, that's very powerful, Kiva. Thank you for sharing that. And I would just like to ask you one follow-up question. Uh, you touched on uh, really the need and the benefit to being vulnerable through the process. Uh, for some of the viewers out there who that might be maybe a little bit harder for them to do, would you give them any recommendations on really how to... Uh, maybe not let their vulnerability, uh, their past kind of be something that scares them off, but really invites them into the discussion. Just know that you're the you're not the only one who has gone through hunger. Um, and if you can help someone else um, feel fulfilled and feel um, loved and feel uh, supported, by opening your mouth, then it's no longer just about you. We're a community. And if you think of your voice as the voice of many, then it will be a lot less intimidating to be vulnerable. But remember, we are all going through something and we all lack something at some point and need support. That's great, Kiva. Thank you so much for sharing. Uh, again, I think you're the the perfect representation in, uh, of of uh, what we're looking for, and Jenny as well. You both are uh, to you know going through the speaker series and becoming and the, and being a members of the CAP program and really being you know really just advocates across our entire community. Uh, and like you said, Kiva, and that's what we instill. It's not it's not just for the benefit to the food bank and to food insecurity. Uh, but it's really to to building up all of the the participants in the programs up too. Uh, that's a huge and I'm a huge component. I'm, I'm so glad that you've been able to feel that way too. Uh, Jenny, I'll I'll pose the same question to you. Uh, what are some lessons you've learned, maybe from the perspective again of someone watching this who is thinking about either starting a program or or embarking on something similar to what you've gone through? Um, well, Bob, because of the speaker series, I am a lifelong hunger fighter. So I just see myself doing hunger fighting in, you know, as my community service for many years to come. And I challenge people to think that anyone can advocate for food security in their circles. And so this is a great launching place for people to learn how to and to learn the mechanism that you'd be integrating your your voice into um, and it's just added so much meaning to my life so it's just a strand of my life that I'm just connecting with people on a different level you know with more intention and it's just it's just enriched my life in a wonderful way um, so I definitely think legislative advocacy programming is worthwhile it just adds so much to my life and hopefully to others as well. So um, it's just enriched my um, forward steps in my advocacy efforts. That's great, Jenny. Uh, thank you so much. And I, I know that in terms of lessons learned, uh, 
that, you know, and as, as Cassidy mentioned earlier, our speaker series and our CAP programs have evolved and kind of changed over time to fit, you know, the circumstances and the need, like, again, like the obvious point being how we kind of really move to, to a virtual component. Uh, but we really do value your input and your feedback uh, into our program because that's how it really gets stronger, better, healthier, and more effective, which is what we're all here for. And again, and to just to kind of close on this panel discussion, you know, it takes a while to enact change, as you all know. It doesn't just happen overnight. And you know, having a a volunteer advocacy group on hand who are you know continue, continuously pushing for the agenda that you know that, that might fit different needs in different parts of of the country is so impactful. And again a lot of elected officials really love hearing from volunteer advocates, especially their constituents. Like it, it's a really powerful message and it really adds uh, to Cassie's point, the qualitative kind of anecdotal uh, component to the, to the data you might have on hand. And they really do enhance each other and make your advocacy push cause stronger than it would be with just one or the other. So uh, again, Jenny, Kiva, thank you so much. Uh, we at the food bank, uh, could not be happier or more grateful to have you both part of our team. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, and with that, I will pass it over to Cassidy to sign us off. Thank you so much, Bob, Jenny, Kiva, and thank you everyone for watching and, you know, really participating with us in this session today. We just want to say thank you so much. And if you have any questions, comments, want to continue the conversation, um, you can find our contact information included in the session notes. And thank you so much for joining us and have a great rest of your conference.